Welcome to the Victory Group Podcast. I'm your host, Eli Jones, and this is the show that helps you conquer the giants that we all face in life. Just as David faced Goliath confidently, knowing God was on his side, you also can face your giants, knowing that you already hold the keys to victory. Victory Groove. And here we go. We have a wonderful guest today. His name is David Deary. I'm going to talk a little bit about him. So first of all, he's got a podcast. It's called Lead On. This is a leadership expert joining us today. David, thank you for joining us. Eli, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to to be on your podcast today. Yeah, good, good, good. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about our faith We certainly want to give you some opportunities to talk about this wonderful organization, your foundation, the Enlisted Leadership Foundation. And uh, I definitely want to hear something about how your faith has gotten you to where you are and how you exercise faith in your leadership, too. So we'll go ahead and get started. Can you give us just an overview of your background? I know you served our country, and we really, really appreciate that. Thank you for your service. Uh, Retired Navy. All right, good. Navy man, is, is that appropriate these days? Navy person, retired yeah, Navy, Navy person? You know, e- either one. A sailor is probably the sailor, easiest one. Sailor, sailor, okay. That, that's that, that's you know, encompasses all of us that served in the Navy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, th- thanks, Eli. Yeah, so, so yes, sir, I, I did serve. I graduated high school in 1984 yeah. and uh, had a job as a petroleum transfer engineer. Um, for those that aren't quite as old, I pumped gas. Uh-huh. Back in those days, oh, I did that too. Younger, we had full what's, service gas. Stations. What's the title again? I want to use that title. I started that way. Pumping <laughs> petroleum, gas, petroleum transfer engineer. I love that. I love that. I've got to put that on my resume. I was working you at a have, gas station, I, I'm full sure service. I heard it from someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was pumping gas. I'm, I'm born and raised in, in uh, uh, then a small town north of San Diego called Carlsbad. It's much bigger uh-huh. now, but I was working at a gas station, and I grew up just about five miles from Marine Corps base Camp Pendleton, the largest Marine Corps base on the West coast. Mm-hmm. And so I, I affectionately say I grew up with Marines. So therefore I joined the Navy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, after about six months after graduation, I, I attempted poorly, uh, to go to junior college and I, I didn't do well in high school. Why would I cert- think I'd do well in college? And so they, they dropped me because I stopped attending classes for like 12 weeks. So mm-hmm. I joined the Navy, uh, like me- everybody joins the service. I, I feel we all joined running from something, uh, not necessarily that something doesn't mean something bad, but I was certainly running from a life of insecurity, of inability to mature and had no financial we- means to move out of my parents' home. Mm-hmm. So I joined uh, for four years. We all just joined for four years. Um, and in that four years period of time, God got a hold of my heart, um, called me to him through a uh, a situation during a deployment uh, and through that experience and the men that he put in my life, um, it changed the direction as, as you know, those of us that God calls, he changes our direction. Amen. And so when I, when my plan was to do the four years and, and get out, uh, God's plan was to have me to stay in and the Navy became my mission field. And over the course of 31 years and uh, thousands upon thousands of people that I had the privilege to work with and many got to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up promoting all the way up the enlisted chain of command, if you will, to the highest enlisted pay grade of E9. And in the Navy, uh, when you are an E9, you're a master chief petty officer. And then when you get to that position at the, that time, for me, I could move into more of this leadership role of a senior enlisted leader where we actually changed, where I came in as a, in communications, a radio men is what we were called up until 1999. They, and they changed the rate from radio men to information system technician. And then I became what is that called a command master chief. So I was a senior enlisted leader to my commanding officer, whether that was a commander or a captain or an admiral. And I did that for the last uh, 14 years of my career. Wow. Wow. 
What a, what a great background. You know, you and I met during the Entrepreneurship Boot Camp for Veterans program. Yes, we did. That, uh, it's a wonderful program. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. It's, so I, I was serving as dean of Mays Business School for six years, and, and I would go and visit with those people going through the EBV program, the Entrepreneurship Boot Camp for Veterans program. And I would always say, and I would say it a little quietly, I would say, this is one of my favorite programs that we offer. And, of course, I would go to another program and say, this is another one of my favorites. <laughs> but EBV is truly one of my favorite programs. And the reason for it is we have wonderful people who have served our country, and they decide to come and spend a week with us on campus and to learn about starting their own businesses. And so it's been really powerful. You go to a dinner as soon as folks get in town, you know, we go to a dinner, and, and usually we'll hear kind of a pitch, if you will. Tell us about your business idea, right? And so, and in, in one week, I mean, it truly is immersive, right? So you're surrounded by successful entrepreneurs, uh, the students who are service people who are now in the class, you're learning from them. You've got faculty members who are also talking about special topics in business. But it's also very impactful because th the next weekend when there's a dinner, they ask you, the leaders of the program will ask you to give that pitch again. And you can hear the difference. It truly is transformational. And you just stay connected. I'm sure you're still connected with those people who went through the EBV program that you went through but we had a chance to meet there and it's been interesting because i've had a chance to listen to folks who have served our country and many of whom not necessarily you but many of whom really don't know what they're going to do next mm -hmm. right and so they come and spend that week with us and they pick up these business ideas and many will go on and start a new business now in your case you're part of the enlisted leadership foundation and, uh, and I think when we talked before, you were telling us how the EBV program helped you kind of craft your value proposition for the Enlisted Leadership Foundation. Can you tell us about yeah. that? Certainly, yes. You know, EBV, just to echo, uh, fantastic program. And, you know, it's not, it's not something where you just apply and you get accepted. I mean, there's a, quite a process, you know, between the application, multiple interviews, and then whatever behind the screen, behind the scenes screenings that mm -hmm. take place. So I was grateful uh, to be accepted to go to Texas A&M uh, and participate in the program. You know, when I started the Enlisted Leadership Foundation back in 2014, so it'll be eight years this month, uh, uh, my friends and I, who are equally passionate about leadership, uh, saw a gap, if you will. You know, every business tries to solve a problem. Um, what we did not do was was, let's go out and check the market and see if this is really our problem or if it's everybody's problem. We just saw a problem. We we tackled it, and that's what we do in the military. Yeah. Well, we started this as a not-for-profit or a 501c3. We're a pass-through nonprofit, so we don't collect any money. But we didn't know we were starting a business. So that's the lack of business experience mm -hmm. that we had. And it, it, honestly, it was three years into this venture of the Enlisted Leadership Foundation that it, it kind of clicked one day. Was, you know what? Yeah, we're a nonprofit, but we're a nonprofit business. Mm -hmm. We're not just a nonprofit. And so when, when I learned about EBV, that was really my – my objective is I felt that I was going back and, and patching holes, right? So it's just like in a nautical term, if you get some below the water line holes, you, you're showing up, you're patching and, and, you know, patch one, another one sometimes will spring up. So I, I, I needed EBV to show me where some of the leaks are that I need to go back and plug those holes, shore them up and, and seal them up. And value proposition was one of those getting better at how to share what we do. To potential supporters, sponsors, and investors. Um, so, it, uh, and you mentioned the connections. We just had our six-month check-in last week. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, the the group is great. We had a very big cohort. We had 30, uh, 30 people in my cohort. Mm -hmm. So, we we do meet. We did a one-month, a three-month, and a six-month check-in. Uh, and we we do have our own group that we can share ideas and check in on each other. And mm -hmm. it's really it's really great. And, yeah. and being veterans, we that's unfamiliar to us, right? Mm -hmm. We have that camaraderie uh, attitude right right oh yeah yeah it's terrific we offer it now twice a year twice by a the year. way we were offering it once a year when you went through it but uh, you also have a fantastic story about your faith mm -hmm. and this podcast is obviously about faith and how we leverage our faith and all that we do and in many cases i've been you know actually interviewed folks we've had conversations about something can happen to someone that's kind of traumatic mm -hmm. right and then I always say that when these things happen, there's energy 
that's produced. And what's been interesting to me is to observe human behavior. Where do people put that energy after something traumatic has happened, right? And in our case, we bring in people who will devote time and use that energy to help others. Right. All right. Can you speak to that concept of taking this energy from yeah. something that may have happened that could have been traumatic and then leveraging that to give back to others? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I briefly alluded to it in, in the first four years. So the incident that took place, the traumatic incident, and uh, was I was married and went on deployment. And a couple months into my deployment, my wife decided that she was going to go off with somebody else. Um, and, you know, and, and, and this isn't, unfortunately, it's not a uh, uncommon story in the military uh, to this day. And you can, I felt I could do one of two ways. I can, um, I could jump off the deep end, hate everybody, and pursue a, a, a unhappy life and one that I'm going to try to get back at her in my own way. Um, but as I said, I said, God had a plan, mm -hmm. and He had, you know, look on back, looking back, He had put in certain men in my life, and I was not raised in any kind of a faith-based home, mm -hmm. although I had faith-based questions. Um, some of these men had answered some of these questions without knowing it. So when this transpired, I chose to change the direction and, and seek their counsel. And so for the two months, and this was before technology, so I had no money for over two months. I had $20 to my, $40 to my name. Um, and so I was able to survive in, in a, over two months, different port visits, hanging out with these men, learning about my faith. And, and it was through that experience that, as I said, I, I ended up looking at the military as my mission field. And when I, you know, every, every time we promote in any position, military otherwise, the sphere of influence increases. Mm -hmm. And where, I, where the military really did a great job of teaching me how to be a positional leader, uh, where I'm going, people are going to follow me because of the rank I wear, mm -hmm. um, through Christ, it, Coming through me, I learned that people will follow me for who I am yeah. by serving them yeah. the way that Christ serves us. Yes. And so, yeah. you know, we hear servant style of leadership and people mm -hmm. put their own spin and de define yeah. it however they want. I truly wanted to look how Christ served uh, through his death on the cross, how he served his 12 disciples and, and doing not doing everything for them, but teaching them, mm -hmm. encouraging them, supporting them, telling them where they screwed up along the way. Uh, but empowering them as well. And uh, that was kind of the, the same model, if you will, that I went out on. And so uh, I never shied away from my faith. I never hid my faith. In fact, as I became a, uh, it took on divisions, departments, and ships, you know, when I would do my, what we call a meet and greet, kind of get in front of the crew, within the first couple of minutes, I would say my leadership style is a servant leader. Yeah, and what that means to me is I follow the model set by Jesus Christ in the Bible. Hmm. And so when you come and ask for leadership advice, it's going to be hmm. from that perspective. I'm, I don't want people to think that, and I would tell, don't think I'm going to preach to you. Um, that's not the intention, but I want my life to be reflective of that. Yeah. But I will say that there were times that people would come uh, it, you know, God uses our experiences, right? So what, mm -hmm. what is traumatic for us, um, whether it's, it's battlefield trauma, sexual trauma, multiple, you know, uh, physical trauma, God can use because now I can identify with people that went through similar experiences. Yeah. So we have that mutual bond already. And that mm -hmm. as a leader, um, until you can establish trust, People will follow you because of what you, the position again. Right. But with that trust, like, well, Master Chief's been through this. He can kind of understand. You know, and I could get done talking with somebody who, who did not have a, a religious bone. I don't like that word, but you know what I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in their body. They, and, and I can end the conversation with, you do mind if I pray for you before you mm -hmm. go? And never did anybody say no. Mm -hmm. I even had a sailor one time on a ship underway. Uh, well, at least when I served, I, I transitioned or retired in 2015. But every night at TAPS, 10 o'clock at night, well, there was always an evening prayer. So whether it was the chaplain, if there was one assigned to the ship, or a lay reader, somebody would do an evening prayer. I had a sailor one time want to file a complaint because he was offended by the evening prayer. And I said, well, you don't have to listen. It's really, you know, we have authority to do this. It's uh, Congress says it's okay. 
And then I, I said, but if you like, I'd like to pray for you about this. Yeah. And he said, OK, okay. <laughs> so, you know, um, it was funny. It was funny. I think I just took him off guard. He didn't know what to do, but right. I did. I just did a quick prayer. That's great. Oh, oh, that's terrific. You know, you, you, you brought up a really good point. You know, we think about how people will use their positional authority. And uh, that formal leadership role. But it's been amazing. I'm also a student of leadership. I love teaching leadership principles and so on. And by the way, I share that with you, the servant leadership and participative leadership. I have my own little leadership philosophy myself. And uh, and when I think about it, I've watched uh, in terms of human behavior, I've watched people really follow, if you will, informal leaders. Mm -hmm. All right. They don't have the position, but they have that influence. Right. And so, you know, it's interesting. I didn't plan on going in this direction, but God has he's in control. So we might as well go there. And that is how do you know, you know, as a person of faith and and believing in this idea of servant leadership, uh, that that kind of faith should make us better leaders in a sense. But, um, you know, you have this leadership foundation. So tell us how you teach this idea of leveraging your faith in terms of the informal leadership? Sure. So the Enlisted Leadership Foundation started, we started uh, as a little bit of context in 2014. So uh, go back a few years before then, in 2008 in the Navy, we had brick and mortar leadership schools that we had to close down as a result of the war effort. Um, Many branches of the military, in order to promote to certain pay grades, there's milestones you have to accomplish. And uh, in our case, there's these, you have to go to a leadership school before you can promote. So because of the war effort, we couldn't take people offline for two weeks to attend the school. So we would give them a waiver with the guarantee, you know, the understanding that they had to attend the school in the future. So we had over 50,000 waivers. Mm-hmm. And so we just kind of cleaned the, cleaned the slate, zeroed everybody out, closed the schools and took a two week course, put it in a two, three day PowerPoint CD and issued the CD to the commands and said, go teach leadership. So quickly, me and others felt that the leadership coming into the senior ranks was lacking and goes back to influence, finding myself in a position to do something. And and I thought, you know, servant leadership works for me and it works for works for others. Um, Clearly, you don't have to just be a servant style leader to get ahead. And there's plenty of people in the military that aren't that do. Um, But I felt. It was what we like to call an, an Enlisted Leadership Foundation relational leadership. Yeah. Being a servant is building relationships. Mm-hmm. Being a Christian is you're, we're building relationships. Yeah. I mean, there's no greater relationship than, than the one between us and our Savior. Yeah. And if that is if that's reflective of how we should live our life, then to me, that relational leadership is the model that we should all be following here. Mm-hmm. So how we teach that in our programs is we have two specific programs, um, one for the E5 level and one for the E6 level. The E5 level, we wrote our own curriculum. and the E6 level, I get the use of the world, if you will. Successful business leaders, um, CEOs, business owners, presidents of foundations, people that share a servant or a relational style of leader, that they would not be in the position they're at for the long term, yeah, I'm not talking to somebody who just showed up a year ago um, and they sound cool on video, but I've known these people or they were recommended. I've interviewed them and they come in and speak. In, fa- in fact, uh, I have a class starting next week with 17 speakers. I think five of them have served and the rest have never served. And it's a way that they get to give back to the military. So some of these speakers often will charge people money. They never charge us money. But it's it in the idea is to show these military leaders that you can be a servant leader and get ahead. You can be a relational leader and get ahead. Some of them have stories of faith. Um, although I don't put myself on the speaking calendar, if you will, I will always find an opportunity, some dead space. And, and because I interact with our, this case, 110 students um, leading up to the class, there's always curiosity of who is this guy behind the emails or the videos. Yeah. And so I will share who I am and share of my faith as I did in uniform. And inevitably, there's going to be some believers in the class that don't know because of their middle grade position 
how to live their faith in such a way that they don't feel embarrassed or threatened or taken seriously, if you will. And so to have someone who's an E9, uh, retired or otherwise, do that is like, wow, if he can, so can I. You know, sometimes we, we operate in these silos. We don't think that we under we understand. And, and in these 110 students, um, I tell them what they all have in common in this particular well, in our classes, what they all have in common is they have to apply to attend. Nobody gets sent to us. We don't reach out to the military and say, will you fill our seats? People have to hear about us and submit an application and over 85% pay their own way to attend our courses. But so they, they all have that common bond to start with. So and we all need something in common and that's it. Right. Yeah. And so from there, that's our starting point. And then through the rest of the class, they hear these stories, they, they, they get to learn about values more. And in some cases they get to learn how to increase their faith or come to faith based on some of the speakers that we, that we have. Yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. Kind no, it does. It, it, it does. You know, this faith in the workplace is something that folks are beginning to talk a lot more about. You know, how do you exercise right. your faith in the workplace? Yeah. And you know, and I'll, I'll interrupt you on that note. I had more, I feel that uh, I had more freezing, freedom to talk faith in a workplace in uniform than I do out of uniform. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. What is work? Yeah. I've got a, a dear friend. So, you know, my wife and I lived in Arkansas for three years, 2012 to 2015. And before we moved home, um, and I got it, I have a dear friend in Arkansas. His name is David Roth, R O T H. And he's got an organization called work matters, hmm. work matters. Uh, and that organization is all about how do you exercise your faith in the workplace uh, oh, wow. And to do it where it's tasteful, you know, uh, and it's and it's received. And I think what we're talking about today, this idea of building around servant leadership and, you know, relational leadership, it's I think those are kind of entry points <laughs> for us to exercise our faith and to share our faith in the workplace. I think we are in position to do those kinds of things. So now lead on is your podcast. Right. So uh, I'm sure you talk about, you know, lots of topics like we're discussing now. So tell us about lead on. What would we yes. listen to when we tune in? Sure. So Lead On, we just started Lead On, Lessons from Military Leaders. I, I've been wanting to do a broadcast, or excuse me, a podcast um, as just another medium mm -hmm. in order to uh, raise awareness of the Enlisted Leadership Foundation, who we are. And some of the greatest stories come from military leaders. In fact, we many times we'll say, God, you just can't make this stuff up. Mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the things, the good and the bad and the ugly. And so I thought, how about if we start a podcast with military leaders, active duty, former, doesn't have to be somebody with 30 years, it could just somebody who served. And, and kind of like what we talk about and how does your experience, what you learned in service, how does that help you to where you are now? And the where you are now could be Rick DeSantis, governor of Florida. People may not know that he served in the Navy. He was a Navy judge advocate general. He was a naval lawyer for uh, several years and served with the Navy SEALs and deployed with the Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. How that, how, so how might that have shaped him to get into politics and his leadership that is now on the main stage? Mm -hmm. So lead on is, is just about that is I want to be able to introduce anybody uh, military or non-military to some military leaders. And what I've learned as I've, um, as I've learned how to be a host and talked with uh, our, our guests, I've learned that everybody has one leadership trait that they really gravitate to. Mm -hmm. So like mine could be relational leadership and, and really humility. I think that's the greatest mm -hmm. of all leadership. If you're not a humble leader, mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to be taken. It, it, it goes to your head. It goes to your head. You really, I mean, humility is such a hard thing to capture. Um, and so when we, through the interviews that we do before the podcast is where we determine what that, what's that one great leadership trait that you want to speak to? Mm -hmm. Because we only talk about 17 minutes. And so that's the trait then once we identify it, that the podcast is going to be centered around. So that way, when the team writes the, you know, this podcast this is what you get to forward to listening to, they'll, the listener then, oh, I'm going to hear about humble leadership and maybe a couple humorous stories or, or maybe some serious stories that will focus around humble leadership 
Um, so that, and, and it's all topics that we cover through our program. So it's just an extension, if you will, a, a snapshot of what students can receive that attend our class. And for donors or, or sponsors, kind of the leadership philosophies that we're trying to embed into the military community. Because every, every person that serves will, is practicing to be a veteran. They're going to come on this side of the blue line someday. And I want them to not only be hired because they're hard workers, they show up on time, they're, they're dedicated and persistent, and they can do a great job. But you got to understand the leadership values that come with them as well. But if all they ever learn is how to be a positional leader, mm -hmm. that's just not going to carry you that right. far up the leadership food chain in a civilian organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, that's really powerful. I'm thinking about our listeners, viewers, and I'm thinking about the person out there who's saying, you know what? I've been in this role for a long time. I think it's time for me to move into leadership. I just feel this calling. <laughs> I feel this tug on my heart that I need to get into leadership. So what would you tell that person who's thinking about getting into leadership? Well, you, you already are. Uh, everybody's a leader, uh, even if you're just leading yourself. Uh, you are a leader. So, but uh, what, what I have found two types of people. I have found that the type of, so in the military, E4, E5 is where you really start getting into leadership. So you, you really don't have a choice in the military mm -hmm. because you want to get promoted to make more money. So then by default, you end up in a leadership position. Although I have met people that I'm good right here. I don't want to promote anymore because I'm fearful to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. So I would add, there's this thing called 360 degree leadership. I'm sure you've heard of it. Oh, yeah. um, so I'd ask some people, uh, if you're like, I, I think I'm ready for the next level, we'll ask some people, trust some people to say, am I ready for the next level? You know, leadership is influence, right? Nothing more, nothing less. We're influencing people to accomplish a task. So are people following you? And are you a good follower? And ask some people below you, beside you and above you, what they think about your leadership, maybe what your strongest or what your weakest trait is. Um, and then just, and then take a step of faith and just try. Yeah. Uh, one thing I love about the military is, is 90% what we do is training. We're mm -hmm. always in a training environment. We're always wanting people. I, I would tell my sailors, I would rather you make a decision that's wrong than no decision at all. Mm -hmm. Because in the time of battle, when, when we're fighting a fire underway or we're under fire, we have to be able to make snap decisions. If you're not accustomed to making a decision in a training environment, how will you make the decision when it's real? And so make a decision. If it's the wrong decision, that's fine. We'll learn from it. We'll yeah. practice it. We'll go back and rehearse it so you don't make the same mistake twice. Or sometimes we make the same mistake twice. You want a little distance separation between that. Yeah. Um, but for that person that's like, you know, I want to be a leader. I'm ready to lead. Well, make sure that uh, your attitude is right. You've got some people that, they think that you have it because they will tell you. And then I just think start with uh, you got to pick your leadership style. And so what are the people that that you liked um, that led you that you liked and which ones you didn't like? In fact, uh, you learn, I believe you learn more from bad leaders than good. Mm -hmm. I'd have sailors say to me, Master Chief, oh, Petter Officer Jones is such a great leader. I'm like, oh, really? Why? Well, Jones just, you know. He's always this and makes me feel like, and he's always looking out for, and it's an emotional response. Uh, yeah. But when they say, Pen Officer Jones is a horrible leader, boy, why is that? Always late. Never, you know, tells us to do one thing, never does it themselves. Hmm. You know, yells all the time. You can really, there's specific things that yeah. bad leaders do, and we see it all the time. And be ready for it, because the higher you go up uh, the food chain, the more visible yes. your actions are. So when I talk about humility, You've got to be able to be humble and you got to get that down early on. That's a foundational leadership principle. You can't wait till you're leading large groups of people to try to figure out how to be humble. Humble. Because yeah. then it's going to be really hard to be humble. We tell people right. uh, when, when you reach where I did, we get a, a badge that you wear called a Command Mastery ba uh, badge. And we tell people, you know, when you put on that badge, it's not that you get any funny or any better looking. But you know, we kind of treat those people that way, don't we? Mm. And if you don't know how to be humble, you're going to think that you are better looking. You think you are funnier. <laughs> you think you have more positions of authority. Yeah. You start doing this stuff that you have no right to do. And that goes mm. back to servant leadership right. and being humble. I mean, I never let people take out my trash. Nobody ever vacuumed my office. Uh, you don't touch any of my stuff. 
Mm. Not that I, I didn't need you to, I would have liked you to, but it was, I needed to be able to do those simple things to keep myself, listen, I do them at home. Yeah. So if I'm going to do them at home, why am I not going to do them at work? Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Good, good. Man, I tell you, the time just flew by. <laughs> it's just there's right. so much here. No, no, this was good. This is a good thing. Uh, this is really good. But uh, I learned so much from you. That was just incredible. And I, I really admire the things that you're doing, uh, especially as I dig more into the foundation that you started, the Enlisted Leadership Foundation. And I plan on tuning in to lead on. I want to hear yeah. about that, too. That's great. Well, brother, if you don't mind, could you lead us in prayer? As we, as we close this episode of Victory Groove? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you placed upon Eli's heart uh, to use this podcast to, to further your message. To uh, There's so many avenues that you've given us uh, that know you, that you've called to reach out and share the gospel and to put you on display in our lives. I thank you for the opportunity to share the, what you've done in my life and and even now through the Enlisted Leadership Foundation, the podcast, the, uh, through my kids, through my church, yes. through anybody I come in contact with, to be able to put you on display. Pray that the words that we speak here came from you, mm-hmm. that they'll be able to help others in uh, their walks of life, life to get better at what they do and maybe uh, to, to, to come to leadership and other things. Wes, Wes Eli uh, and the future guests, that he has and the different people you bring in his life to bring on the podcast in Jesus name. Amen. In Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you thank so you, much. Mike. God bless you. We thank really you. appreciate you taking the time. And My I want to thank our listeners too. Thank you for taking your time to listen in to victory groove. Remember we already have the victory. We just need to get our groove back. God bless you all. We'll catch you next time on victory groove. I'm uh-huh.